getting me started. Good morning and good afternoon. Greetings from Bangkok. Thank you for joining with us for the 10 Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development uh, site event on strategic partnership for policy impact. Multi-stakeholder engagement for advancing uh, sustainable development goals in Asia. So as you already seen uh, and I mentioned from the title, this is the site event for the 10 Asia Pacific Forum. However, this is actually SEI Asia first event. And this event is organized uh, by SEI with the support from UN Habitat, uh, Asia Indigenous People Pack, and Office of the National Water Resources in Thailand. My name is Kuntum Malati and I'm a research fellow from SEI Asia and I'll be your moderator for today. Today, we are bringing the themes of collaboration and partnership and share how scientific evidence and innovative ideas transform into action. With seven years left to achieve the global goals, we are in a crucial point as only few of the 17 SDGs and their 169 targets are likely to be met. According to the UNSCAP SDG progress report that just launched last week, uh, in this forum, it shows that in countries with spatial situations, including least developed countries, landlocked developing countries, and small island developing states, goals on zero hunger, which is SDG 2, clean water, SDG 6, season work and economic growth, SDG 8, and sustainable consumption production, SG, SDG 12, are regressing. However, there's one goal that constantly backsliding in all of the Asia Pacific countries, which is SDG 13 on climate action. As 2023 marks a new phase in the pursuit of global sustainable development, and as the state of affairs make it clear, as I explained in the beginning, this must be a turning point for all of us. So today we will discuss some of the key transboundary issues on climate change, Social inclusive, uh, social inclusion, governance, and water management in the region. To share their extensive experience with us in formulating policy agenda and action, we are honored to have uh, four distinct panelists, which I would like to introduce very briefly. Uh, we have Ms. Claudia Garcia Zaragoza from UN Habitat. Uh, we have Ms. Ploy Achakovisut, research fellow from SEI Asia. We have uh, Ms. Nitaya Erkana, Executive Council Member from Asia Indigenous People PAC. We have also Mr. Atapong Shantanumit uh, from Office of the National Water Resource Thailand. So warm welcome to all panelists and thank you for, for taking the time to join us today. To start this exciting discussion, uh, I would like to invite SEI Asia Center Director, Mr. Niall O'Connor, to deliver his opening remark. Niall, please, the screen, the screen is yours. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to welcome you to the 10th Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, uh, the side event which is aiming to support and review progress on the 2030 Agenda for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, indeed, as just mentioned, I'd like to also thank our co-organizers and the guests that are with us here today, uh, Ms. Claudia Zaragoza from UN Habitat, uh, Tristan Ace from the AVPN Philanthropic Network, uh, Ms. Nataya Irkana, the Executive Council Member for the Asian Indigenous Peoples Pact, and Mr. Atapong Chantanamat from as Director of Policy and Master Plan Divisions for the Office of National Water Resources Thailand. And indeed, our very own staff, uh, Dr. Ploy, Achak Kunusut uh, as a research fellow from SEI Asia, and of course the moderator Kuntum uh, Malati, also a research fellow for Asia. So thank you all for, for the great work you put in to support this. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with SEI, the Stockholm Environment Institute is an independent international research policy think tank. SEI has been engaged in environmental and development issues at the local, regional, and global levels through evidence-based research, capacity building, and stakeholder engagement that covers a broad range of topics, including climate change, energy transitions, urban development, natural resources and water governance, circularity, and gender equality. And we've been doing this now for over three decades. And a key focus of SEI is the science to policy partnerships for driving the policy agenda on sustainability. And to do this, SEI bridges the science and policy domains to collaborative um, processes with a diversity of partners at very different scales 
in order to provide evidence-based research for policy actions towards environmental sustainability and indeed social equality. So I think some of SEI's success is built on providing credible, high quality science to support the policymakers to make effective decisions for society itself. And towards this end, we promote and strengthen lasting partnerships to build public policy and to design technical solutions together with communities and the key stakeholders while upholding our core values, such as I said, gender equality and human rights for all. So our various partnerships comes in many forms and we're keen to continue to, to strengthen them and, and build on them. But working with community stakeholders, often affected by the policy issues at hand and at the center of policy development processes. We work with civil society organizations to ensure greater inclusion and awareness raising. We work more with the private sector who bring technologies and amazing innovation and solutions to the table. The public sector who enacts and implements the public policy and indeed with academia who help us gather evidence and support a consistent narrative for policy dialogues. And recently some examples of the work we do from research to policy supported by the governments of Sweden and Australia respectively include the 15 years work we've been doing with the Sustainable Mekong Research Network, SummerNet as many may know, and this is driving policy relevant research and policy engagement on water insecurity across the Mekong region. And more recently, we've initiated the newly thought through Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tank Network, again, a high level research and policy engagement consortium of like minded institutes for knowledge production and policy based information sharing across the region. But coming to the SDGs, SEI stands behind the SDGs as they set and as the world's first effort to bring together all dimensions of sustainable development to reach specific actionable targets across a range of environment and development sectors. However, as we've just heard, it's quite alarming that the Asia and Pacific region remains off track in achieving all of the 17 SDGs by 2030. And as stated in the recent UNSCAP's SDG progress report, although some progress has been made in reducing poverty, on zero hunger, on quality education, and in reducing inequalities, the region is still lagging behind or even going in reverse on climate actions and on water, among others. So it's imperative that we recognize the importance of the SDGs and create recovery strategies aligned with the principles of the 2030 agenda. So SDG 17 on partnerships for the goals calls for actions to strengthen the means of SDG implementation and revitalize global partnerships for sustainable development. It recognizes the essential roles of partnerships as a primary way of bringing together the key stakeholders to help achieve these goals. And as the title of this session suggests, Increasing the participation of local actors and other key stakeholders in international forums helps increase the exchanges of and the co-production of knowledge and for the effective implementation of the SDGs themselves. It also increases interactions with peers from other countries helping to learn and share ideas. And this integrated approach is essential to developing programs that reach all areas within governments, civil societies and private sector to bring about and support sustainable development. So the SDGs can only be realized with strong inclusivity and multi-stakeholder engagements. And this is from the local to global levels, building partnerships and cooperations across different sectors in a transdisciplinary manner, ensuring both public and private integration. However, we know that SDG delivery still faces many challenges, and these may result in compromising the inclusivity of beneficiaries that we aim to have represented in the process. And we must avoid this at all costs, Otherwise, we risk veering away from the principle of universality, integration, and from leaving no one behind, which are the cornerstones of the 2030 agenda. And indeed, many questions are being raised about what's the best approach in building successful partnerships, or how do we influence policymakers? And to answer these questions, we need strategic partnerships with greater levels of trust and indeed transparency to help facilitate more constructive and inclusive dialogues. So hopefully this Sustainable Development Forum side event will help focus on advancing the SDGs through this inclusive multi-stakeholder engagement process and through strategic partnerships for policy impacts. We will discuss key transboundary issues on climate change and environmental sustainability alongside gender equality and social inclusion. So I trust that these discussions will lead to some meaningful impacts as we showcase multi-stakeholder engagement processes and how to contribute to the empowerment of local communities and marginalized groups through the co-creation of knowledge and in formulating effective policy agendas and actions that work from the bottom up. 
I hope the side event on strategic partnerships for policy impact will serve as a platform where we can translate our discussions into future collaborations and indeed actions. And at this crucial moment in human history, we face some huge environmental and climate change challenges. We need stronger and lasting partnerships that just can help us support the urgent transformation needed to ensure an inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia. And I think, as everybody says, the time to act is now. So thank you for joining us today, for giving us your you know, inputs and thoughts on this. And I look forward to future collaborations together, as well as continuing to learn and share our knowledge over the course of these days. So I thank you and I look forward to uh, an interesting event ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Niall, for highlighting how important it is to link science, partnership, inclusive dialogue, as well as bottom-up policy uh, approaches that could lead to transformative change. So we will, without further ado, we will start our panel discussion today. And before that, I would like to uh, extend a warm welcome to Mr. Tristan Ace from Asia Ventures Philanthropy Network. Uh, I apologize, I did not mention in the beginning. Uh, so yeah, I would like to invite our first panelist, Ms. Claudia Garcia Zaragoza, which is a partner and project manager from UN Habitat. Ms. Claudia is the partnership and project manager of the SDG locali localization and local government team uh, of UN Habitat. And their urban practices branch, she is the focal point on project implementation in Middle East and North Africa countries and Asia Pacific. Claudia holds a bachelor degree on global studies and an LLM in European and international law by the University Pompo Fabra in Barcelona. She has specialized in building the capacitating of local government to fulfill global agenda such as the 2030 agenda and its SDGs. So Ms. Claudia will present on pathways for SDG acceleration and local 2030 coalition. Good morning. Good morning, everyone Good morning. Uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, it is a great pleasure to be part of this panel discussion. Thank you very much for the great work to the, to the organizers and to all the, the co-organizers that are present here. Um, as Kuntum was um, advancing, I will uh, focus the presentation on the role of SDG localization, which is the implementation of the sustainable development goals at the local level and uh, the local 2030 initiative. Uh, I am not entirely sure what is the familiarity of all of you with this topic, so I won't get uh, through them from the very beginning, but I will give some background. But before that, I wanted to extend uh, the gratitude from uh, from UN Habitat to the Stockholm Environment Institute for uh, their leading role in the in the region and in particular for supporting uh, the local 2030 coalition through the baseline baseline assessment for the 10 years. That being said, um, uh, I'm going to share my screen and as as usual with these processes, I will appreciate if you can confirm that you can see correctly the, the screen. Yes, we can see, thank you. Fantastic. So this is the title of the, of the presentation. And I will start with, uh, I am not entirely sure now that I can pass the, the slides. I will start with just uh, one quick reflection on uh, the evolution of universal agendas and in particular the one of um, the sustainable development goals. One of the lessons learned from the Millennium Development Goals was that um, partnerships are needed and uh, is um, inclusive multi-stakeholder and multi-level partnerships is the, the way forward to achieve the universality of, of uh, sustainable development goals. And this is what the 2030 agenda um, stress and, uh, and highlight by giving one standalone goal to the same, to the, to the aim of uh, enhancing partnerships for the goals. So how the agenda looks like in a sense is that we have 17 agreed goals that will, uh, um, that are needed to advance sustainable development and that are needed to, um, to improve humanity as, as we know it. And uh, while the 16 of these goals are substantial, 
they tell us where to set the light, shed the light on the problems that need to be tackled, on the different objectives that we need to fulfill by 2030. There is one goal that tells us about the how. How do we need, how do we, uh, what should we do to, to implement the, the agenda? How do we need to work, all of us, the different stakeholders from the local communities to the UN and global organizations to really work shamelessly together as one? And this is uh, SDG 17. So this is a really uh, a fact that um, set the set a new a new way of working of working together from from different organizations. And it is a very important fact that um, that this agenda recognized that. And uh, in a sense, this reinforced the means of implementation and the Global Alliance for Sustainable Development. So I would like to have a quick look to how uh, the details of this SDG, SDG 17, that talks about partnerships. And this SDG is very complete and, uh, and complex. And it's made up of 19 targets and 25 indicators that measure the advancement of this target. And uh, these indicators and targets are um, grouped in five mic uh, macro categories. These five ma macro categories um, describe the means of implementation of not only this, this goal, goal number 17, but also the overall agenda. And it goes from finance to technology, to capacity building, trade, and then uh, what uh, has been uh, named as systemic issues. The systemic issues uh, concern policy and institutional coherence, multi-stakeholder partnerships, and data monitoring and accountability. I am not going to go through all the different targets and indicators in this presentation, but I wanted to highlight some of, some of these targets that are also very much linked to, to this particular session, such as, the, um, such as target 17.14 that talks about enhancing policy coherence for sustainable development, or, um, or uh, target 17.13 about encouraging effective partnerships. But then there are also other, other targets that relate more on the partnerships for financing, for example, or uh, partnerships for sharing of technology and data. So this is overall how this SDG looks like and uh, the roadmap that it sets. And now you might be wondering what is the role of local government, of local action, and SDG localization in all of this? And in this regard, let me, let me start by sharing that local action has never been so central as in recognized at the UN level as it is today. The agenda, the agenda, uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, recognizes the role of local governments by, um, by uh, defining a standalone goal on cities and human settlements, which is SDG 11, but also it recognizes the importance of working, with, with, of working at the local level and with local governments throughout the different targets of the, of the agenda. And the, the relevance of local governments in, uh, in uh, universal sustainability is important for different reasons, but I would like to highlight three of them. Uh, first of all, because of the privileged position for partnerships, for partnerships, sorry, given that it is the, the closest uh, government, government level, the, the government level closest to the uh, to local communities and, it, and its citizens. Therefore, it's the one that has the widest knowledge on uh, on what is happening on the ground. There is a mic on, so I'm going to stop. No. Um, then because it's, as I was mentioning, it's, it's a government of proximity. So it's really a government that can put forward the needs of local communities, of marginalized groups, in not only in a national policy making, but also in international one. And the, the third point is that policy coherence um, happens at the local level. If we are to uh, eradicate hunger and poverty, if we are to achieve um, gender equality or uh, sustainable consumption, this needs to happen at the local level. Um, however, 
local governments cannot do it alone. They cannot act alone. And they need the support of different, uh, of different levels of government, of different partners. And this is what the diagrams of the right in my screen uh, tell us about. And um, in this sense of building partnerships of inclusive governance, I would like to highlight just three pillars. The first one is vertical integration, which is the institutional coordination across, across levels of governments that goes from local level, but even like uh, municipal and grassroots levels to the national level, to the regional uh, and, the, and the international one. Then we have horizontal integration that deals, uh, that has to do with the policy, with policy interactions across sectors and domains. And this is a key point for the siloing, which is one of the uh, main challenges that has been sometimes um, highlighted when talking about the implementation of the agenda. Um, and then the third one is a stakeholder engagement. It's not only about levels of governments, but it should also be about um, uh, cross-sectoral and uh, multi-actor partnerships. And uh, again, for this, the local level, as I was mentioning before, it's in a privileged position because they have, uh, they have the, the umbrella of what is happening at the local level and they can enable these partnerships that then can scale up to the national and to international levels. Um, these three components that I was mentioning, vertical, horizontal, and stakeholder, are considered key for the implementation of the SDGs. And this is gathered in uh, a new, well, a revamped uh, work stream that UN Habitat is, um, is advancing, which is the one on multi-level governance for SDG localization. Um, I'm not going to get into the details, but in these slides, you have uh, different links and I can also put them in the chat. But uh, recently, um, we have launched uh, full research on multi-level governance for SDG localization that is very much practically oriented on different practices that, uh, that, have, that are um, considered good practices, but also different domains and conclusions that have been drawn from, this, from these practices. And then uh, the results for the multi-level governance platform in which we share different resources, publications, and events related to, to the topic. Besides the point on multi-level governance that I have explained, um, UN Habitat um, differentiates different components on, of, of their work on SDG localization uh, that go from technical cooperation, knowledge development and capacity building, global advocacy and partnerships. Um, being mindful of the time that, uh, that we have and that I have for this presentation, I'm not going to get into all the details, but I would like to share some insights about each of these pillars of work. Starting from the technical cooperation, UN Habitat has a comprehensive uh, approach to work on the localization of the SDGs, supporting technically local and regional governments, but not only local and regional governments, but also uh, national governments and other stakeholders. How do we do this? We do this through um, the collection of disaggregated data related to the SDGs and urbanization by using the global urban monitoring framework, which is the UN-wide set of urban indicators that was approved by the UN Statistical Commission, which is the same one that approved the indicators for the SDGs. Uh, and what this, what this framework does is in a way translating the global goals that, were, uh, that use a national language, because as you know, the agenda um, is directed towards member states, it's trans translating all of these indicators to the needs and to the language of, uh, of urban settings and local governments. Um, the second component is um, the participatory baseline assessment through the development of voluntary local reviews. Uh, voluntary local reviews are local reports on the SDG implementation that different local and regional governments are undertaking. And this is inspired by the voluntary national reviews. Um, that member states submit on a voluntary basis to the high-level political forum in July. Uh, and here on this point of voluntary local reviews, I want to highlight the point of participatory. Um, if we really want to understand and have a, a clear picture of what is happening in a given territory, we need to include different stakeholders. We need to include the communities and the marginalized groups 
to hear their voices and to hear the recommendations for the future that they want. And uh, based on the data collection and the participatory based and assessment, then we proceed with implementation through the SDG series initiative, which is a flagship program in human habitat um, uh, that really looks into the implementation of, uh, of, the, of the recommendations that were set forward in the voluntary local review, for example, translating them into um, local development plans and city development strategies, for example. Uh, I wanted to take more time to explain the technical cooperation component, but then for the other three, I will go a bit more quickly. Uh, on the knowledge development and capacity building, we think that it's very important to really capacitate local and regional governments to fulfill their potential uh, to, to advance on the, on the agenda. And we do this through in-person trainings and online courses. On in-person trainings, I wanted to highlight the SDG localization modules that have been developed by uh, UCLG, the Global Task Force for Local and Regional Governments, UN Habitat, UNDP, with the support of uh, the Diputación de Barcelona. And uh, there are four modules uh, on the different topics that you can see on the screen. The thing about these modules is that they are very practically oriented and they are translated into trainings of trainings. And then uh, we have a wide offer on online courses on the different domains of localization. I have highlighted here three of them. One is the voluntary local reviews online course. Um, a, another one which relates voluntary local reviews with recovery strategies. This is one that is on the making uh, and that we, are, that we are preparing to hopefully launch uh, rather soon. And then the third one on the implementation of the new urban agenda. Um, so then the third component is the one on global advocacy, which we find critical to, um, to really put forward this point on uh, strategic partnerships for policy coherence, because we believe that local governments should have more opportunities to be on, the, uh, on a national, but in this case also international and global debates about sustainability because of their critical role. Uh, on this point on global advocacy, 2023 and 2024 will be key years to discuss SDG localization, to discuss the role of local governments on sustainable development. And here I have highlighted some of these uh, key high level moments, um, such as uh, the UN Habitat Assembly. UN Habitat Assembly, you should think about it as the General Assembly on Urbanization, and it takes place every four years. And this year in 2023, it will take place again. It will be the second, the second assembly. And the topic of, of this assembly is a sustainable urban future through inclusive and effective multilateralism, achieving the SDGs in terms of, of crisis. And I wanted to mention in this presentation that uh, the assembly will take place in person and that the application, the submission for side events has been open and will remain open until the 11th of April, in case there is interest in, in application for, for events. Again, I can share the link in the chat. Yeah. Sorry, Claudia, just, just remind you about the time. Uh, yeah, thank you very if, much. If it's possible if you can wrap up. Thank you yeah. very much. We will just Q&A after this. Fantastic. Uh, wrapping up, there will be other events that you can see here, and I, I hope that you can have access to the, to the slides. And I would like to wrap up with a point on strategic partnerships, which is the core component of our approach. On the strategic partnership, a very important milestone is the Local 2030 Coalition that was revamped on uh, September 2021 during the SDG moment. And in this sense, Local 2030 Coalition is the UN-wide initiative for, uh, on SDG localization that is chaired by UN Habitat and another UN agency on a rotational basis every two years. Um, about the coalition, uh, mention and again, uh, thank the work of the Stockholm Environment Institute that developed a baseline, a baseline study on uh, the identification of gaps that need to be filled to achieve the, the sustainable development goals at the local level and at the same time, this study defined the strategy for Local 2030 Coalition. The three components that you see on the right are the different baseline gaps that were identified by this study, which are advocacy, action, and monitoring, which are key. 
And just to conclude, if we are to achieve the SDGs uh, and to really keep, keep on track for a, a, a shared humanity, for, for our shared humanity, for our shared future, we need to work together. Um, and uh, based on this, UN Habitat stands ready to work with all of you to support your work on the implementation of the SDGs. Thank you very much. And apologies if I went a bit over time. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much for highlighting the importance of multi-level governance process, especially focusing on how local government should have a crucial role in advocating SDGs. And I really also like that you highlight the importance of having participatory and inclusive process integrated in monitoring and measuring SDGs. We'll actually revisit this again when we uh, with other panelists. So happy to discuss that a bit more. Uh, now moving on to our second panelist, uh, which is our very own SEI Asia Ploya Jackal Visut. Uh, Ms. Ploy is a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute Asia, whose policy and research and stakeholder engagement focuses on aligning fossil fuel supply with climate, air pollution, and health goals. She co-leads SEI's initiative on tackling carbon lock-in and serve as a coordinating lead author and lead analyst of the production gap report series that SEI publishes in coordination with the UN Environment Program. The report tracks the misalignment between governments plan fossil fuel production and the global level consistent with the Paris Agreement. So Ms. Floyd will give presentation on transitioning away from fossil fuels for a net zero world. Uh, we'll have the slides up. Thank you, Kuntum. And hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists and members in the audience for joining us today. Um, can you go to the full screen for the slides, please? So um, yeah, while we're waiting for that, as Kuntum mentioned, I'm, go I'm going to be sharing with you some of SEI's work on fossil fuel supply side policies. Thank you. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. So at SCI, as Kunta mentioned, mentioned, I helped to lead the Production Gap Report series, which we publish in collaboration with UNEP and several other international research institutes. And our first report was released back in late 2019, and it was designed to provide a complementary analysis to the annual UNEP Emissions Gap Report series. As I'm sure many of you are already aware, the Emissions Gap Report um, series provides an assessment of the gap between countries' greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction targets as pledged under their nationally determined contributions or NDCs and the emissions levels that would be consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals of limiting global warming to 1.5 or well below 2 degrees Celsius. However, to date, few, if any, fossil fuel producing countries have evaluated how their production targets might be aligned or misaligned with the Paris Agreement's goals or with their own domestic climate mitigation ambitions. And so our 2019 um, production gap report introduced the concept of a fossil fuel production gap as a new metric to track the discrepancy between the levels of fossil fuel production being planned by governments worldwide and the global levels that would be consistent with the Paris Agreement's temperature limits. And today I'm going to be sharing with you results from our most recent report, which was released at the end of 2021. And our next report is slated for release in early November this year, just before COP28. Next slide, please. So the global production gap analysis rests on two major components. The first is the one highlighted here on this slide, which is the global pathways of fossil fuel production that would be consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. And for this, we rely on the mitigation scenario database compiled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these scenarios are generated by integrated assessment models that simulate how the world's energy and land use systems can be transformed in the most cost effective way to stay below a given temperature threshold, including how quickly we need to reduce fossil fuels in our energy supply mix. And so after screening out scenarios with very high reliance on as yet unproven carbon dioxide removal technologies, we derived the median pathway and interquartile ranges of the global amounts of coal, oil, and gas supply that would be consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals as shown by the blue and green lines on this figure. Next slide, please. 
And the second major component is um, this so-called countries production plans and projections pathway. Next slide, please. To explain how we derive um, this pathway, essentially we compile and search for the most recent data on coal, oil and gas production projections that are publicly available from the national energy plans, outlooks and strategy documents of major fossil fuel producing governments and state owned enterprises. And in, in our 2021 report, we were able to gather data from 15 major fossil fuel producing countries that altogether accounted for around 75% of global production, including for the um, Asia Pacific region, China, India, and Indonesia. And their aggregate projections are then scaled up to a global trajectory based on their estimated shares of future global production under a scenario modeled by um, the IEA consistent with countries fulfilling their climate pledges. Next slide, please. And so the production gap is this discrepancy between countries' planned and projected fossil fuel production and global production levels that would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius in any given year. And in our 2021 report, we found that the size of the production gap has essentially remained largely unchanged compared to our 2019 and 2020 assessments. The world's governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and 45% more than would be consistent with limiting warming to 2 degrees Celsius. And global production levels implied by countries' climate pledges as shown by the gold line in this figure um, also remain higher than those consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals. And so this means that although we're seeing a growing number of countries announcing net zero emissions targets and increasing their climate ambitions, they have yet to plan for a rapid and sustained reduction in fossil fuel production that these targets require. There remains a vast disconnect between the two. Next slide, please. And to end this presentation, I just wanted to reflect on one point, which is that Having worked on the production gap analysis and analyzing the IPCC mitigation scenarios over the past four years, this made me realize that from a pure climate mitigation perspective alone, there can be many different fossil fuel transition pathways and climate mitigation strategies that could conceivably be consistent with achieving net zero emissions. Um, but this unfortunately often relies on as yet unproven carbon dioxide removal and carbon capture and storage technologies, which some of these models might select as a cost effective option. So for example, looking at the gas supply trajectories, we see some scenarios phasing out gas um, pretty much quickly between now and mid-century, um, whereas others actually see kind of a continued long-term role for gas, um, so long as it can be coupled to carbon capture and storage technologies in the future. Uh, last slide, please. However, this kind of thinking fails to account for all the harmful public and environmental health harms of our continued fossil fuel reliance, which are especially being borne by industry workers and local frontline communities and ecosystems living near fossil fuel uh, infrastructure sites. And so, for example, science tells us also that each year, almost 9 million people worldwide are dying prematurely from air pollution arising from fossil fuel combustion. And our continued fossil fuel reliance is also a major driver of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. And for those of you who may be interested, I've written a perspective on this issue with some other SEI colleagues as noted here on this slide. And so I think it's really important that as decision makers set global national agendas on decarbonizing our energy systems in line with climate goals, they also consider the risks of, for example, betting on unproven carbon dioxide removal or carbon capture and storage technologies, um, as well as consider how different climate mitigation strategies might be aligned with the achievement of other SDGs and also with equity principles. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a very interesting uh, overview on the production gap report. Seems like although the transformation towards net zero greenhouse gas emission is underway and many countries have pledges to do so, it does not necessarily align with the global agendas. Uh, we'll revisit this again and I hope you can share more information during our Q&A. And I would like to remind our participants as well, if you have any questions, any comments, 
feel free to share. We have the Q&A box, but if you cannot access them, you could also put your question or comments in the chat uh, and we can always monitor the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist uh, will be Mr. Tristan Ace, uh, Chief Product Officer from Asia Ventures Philanthropy Network. Tristan leads FEPN's policy and thematic based program, which are focused on supporting a wide range of impact organizations to more strategically deploy financial and human resources to address key social and environmental issues in the Asia Pacific region. He has more than 18 years experience working in more than 20 countries in Central and Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, and for the past 11 years uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Tristan, uh, it's, we're glad to have you here and I'll let you take the lead. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here um, this afternoon, uh, to be with you um, and to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work that um, AVPN has been doing uh, to ensure that the voice of our members um, is heard um, amongst policy conversations um, at both regional and global level. Um, I think I wanted to start just by framing um, what I plan to say um, with what I've heard already um, and you know, thinking about Claudia's um, comments around the, the, the role of um, technical cooperation, knowledge and capacity building, advocacy and strategic partnerships as um, a set of approaches to addressing this, um, this SDG uh, gap, the gaps we currently have um, in, in meeting the SDGs. And then also really, um, I suppose, take it aback uh, I'm not sure what, what the right phrase is, but sort of, um, but certainly the very sobering statistics that were and, and presentation by Ploy here around the fuel production gap and the and the and, the, and this phrase which which struck struck me. Um, you said that Ploy the vast disconnect between the current reality of the um, um, on the ground and the and the, and the and these and these ambitious net zero targets. So they're looking at really. Um, trying to use that data to try to influence governments to, um, with 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 their policy um, approaches. Um, the theory of change that AVPN has um, in addressing this problem is really the challenge of mobilizing capital. So this is the, and I want to sort of frame that in this context because that's the the angle that we take in trying to address this problem. Um, we know that there are many many things that need to change both in the in the regulatory environment, in the way that we partner with each other, in, in, in ensuring that the voice of the most underserved communities are heard in these policy conversations. Um, and that's all incredibly important. The angle that we take as AVPN is really trying to understand how we can um, mobilize more capital uh, to address these um, critical issues. And in this context, of course, the climate crisis. Um, so just a bit of background then, um, ABPN is um, the largest social investment network in uh, Asia. We have about 600 members and our members are united by a shared goal um, in mobilizing capital to uh, achieve, achieve um, uh, the SDGs really. Um, and our members include um, a range of organizations from the largest foundations in the world. So philanthropic capital um, increasingly um, impact capital as well. So impact funds, development finance institutions, family offices who are looking to um, diversify their portfolios um, and um, uh, invest in, in impact um, for uh, projects, businesses, funds, et cetera. So our role really is in trying to help those organizations do their work uh, more effectively. Um, and and, and how do we do that? Well, we do that around our thematic focus areas, of which one is our climate action platform. And what I what I intend to do just for the next few minutes or so, and uh, Kuntan, you perhaps can tell me how much time I have, so I can I can just ascertain how long I should I should spend, because um, I could go on for a long time. But perhaps I might just give a few a few insights just 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 in a few minutes, so we have more time for the Q and A. Yes, thanks for checking, Tristan. Uh, you will have around five minutes. Uh, or okay. seven, ten over seven, but yes, we'll have a Q and A. I'll try six <laughs> minutes. It would be great if um, anybody 
um, who's here today, do feel free to pop your pop your 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 questions in the chat box so that I can um, adjust what I have to say accordingly to what you're interested in hearing about. But um, what I what I want to do is talk about two things really. First of all, very very briefly, and I'll try to keep each to two minutes. First of all, the work we've done, particularly with our with our community of social investors, to understand the barriers that they're facing in mobilizing capital to climate um, globally, and that's particularly focusing on our philanthropic and concessional capital members. So, you know, at the moment there's still very very small amounts of um, philanthropy going into climate. We try, to, we, we try to really understand why that why that is the case, particularly in developing parts of the world. <clears throat> and then secondly, I can talk very briefly, if I have time right now, or perhaps you know, during the Q&A sessions, about some of the recommendations that we've made to governments through our work with G20 uh, last year in Indonesia and this year in India. In fact, we just submitted an input paper hot off the press last week to the uh, G20, to the Sustainable Finance Working Group, looking at um, addressing their priority area, which was in um, how to mobilize um, SG, SDG financing. So very, very aligned to the topic of today's conversation. Um, so what are the barriers that we're seeing? Well, um, I think the the um, there's a few different things that I think are interesting from a, from, a, from from our perspective today. And one that, one that I'll that I'll draw out, and it's this dilemma between of, of, of the challenge of mitigation versus adaptation um, and we find that the um, the very technical analysis um, can be very and, and, and the numbers around uh, decarbonizing can be can be really daunting and, and very confusing uh, to our members who are often engaged uh, in more direct um, projects with communities um, around issues that impact their day-to-day -day lives. Now, of course, many of those issues are increasingly being impacted by climate change, but they might not be realized as such. Um, and this, so, so the question for us is how we take these, um, these organizations that might already be investing in health or in water or in education and help them to think about how they um, address that issue with a, a climate lens. So this intersectionality question is one that we're really trying to grapple with. Um, and we see this as a, as a pathway uh, to take investors on that journey from um, where climate is, is, is an afterthought or not something that's part of their portfolio. So something that might, um, that might become integrated with an existing issue that they are attempting to deal with. And this is um, a, an approach that we're, that we're experimenting with at the moment with a number of social investors um, in India. And we are planning to also launch um, programs across mainland China and across Southeast Asia as well in this area. So that's one key uh, barrier and, and, and one, one way we want to engage with them. The second um, is aligning investors with government priorities. Um, this issue in some contexts can still be quite politically sensitive. So there's a, a real opportunity, we think, to uh, engage our private sector actors with governments um, and through that process, build trust, through build understanding, build, build collaboration. We know that there will be one of the, um, the uh, there's a huge amount of new wealth in the region. Everyone talks about the, the biggest, um, biggest tra um, transfer of wealth in human history taking place across, across the Asia Pacific region. So there's a real, and we know that the next generation want to do things differently than previous generations. So there's a real opportunity to shift the way that these new wealth holders behave and act. And so we think that that's a real um, uh, opportunity for us as well. So those are two, two areas of, of, of barriers and, 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 um, and some, of the, some of the strategies that we are um, we're embarking upon. I'll just talk about um, one more, um, which we think might be interesting. And this is the, the role that that we uh, that cap catalytic capital can play, and by catalytic capital, what I mean is is, is utilizing philanthropic capital um, to to mobilize private sector investment um, as a way to reduce the risk, as a way to um, provide some uh, first loss um, in, in in blended finance structures, for example, and and therefore um, have create funding instruments that can invest in some of those longer term projects that might not be financially viable or as financially viable today 
Um, so a few different strategies and a few obstacles and a few different strategies that we've been embarking on and, and some recommendations there as well. But I'll stop and happy to take um, any questions. Perfect. Thanks, Tristan. I actually have the privilege to attend uh, last year uh, FUPN Global Conference. Uh, and it is really showing that it's, you know, there's a lot of issues and intersectionalities, uh, a lot of funding that actually have a very strong component on SDGs, but not using the climate lens uh, framework, as you mentioned. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll definitely end. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm also part of the of the SDG baseline project that uh, UN Habitat has shared. And one of the issues actually looking at uh, the, the financing gap on SDGs. So it's all interlinked and I hope we can have a discussion uh, on this later on the Q&A. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome our next presenters. So Ms. Uh, Nitaya Erkana, Executive Council Member from Asia Indigenous People uh, PAC. Ms. Nitaya Erkana is a Hmong Indigenous group from the northern of Thailand. Uh, and she currently working with Intermountain People Education and Culture in Thailand Association. Uh, she also executive member of the Asian Indigenous People PAC or AIPP and secretariat member of the Network of Indigenous People in Thailand or NIPT. So Ms. Nitaya will present on local community empowerment in policy engagement. Thank you, Ms. Nitaya. Oh, you are still muted. Oh, uh, I think your sound is a bit unclear. Can you? Yeah. And again, yeah, I would like to remind for uh, for all of you who's joining our session, this is a very rich uh, and also unique as we have uh, researcher, we have academias, we have a UN agency, we have philanthropies, uh, and then representative for mindfulness and indigenous group as well as government agencies. So feel free to ask any questions uh, and you can drop this in the chat. So Mr. Nitaya, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks again for inviting me to uh, present our the, our issue from the grassroots uh, to all of you. And um, uh, first of all, I would like to say that our organization is an uh, indigenous organization and that are working with the indigenous people in Thailand and in order to enhance the capacity of the community leaders, which are uh, including the indigenous women, children, youth, and also the a uh, knowledgeable person the, and the person with disability. And we are also um, trying to uh, strengthen the mechanism of our indigenous networks in different committee or different uh, uh, indigenous group uh, to, and also support them to uh, uh, manage their community based on the culture and livelihood and are uh, engaged to advocacy and policy changing. So uh, firstly, you know, when we heard about the SDG, in, in the beginning, we felt that the SDG are uh, a hope of indigenous people who are or have been long forgetting and left behind because we are like uh, marginalized of uh, the people in, in Thailand. And um, because of our, we found that uh, all the 17 goals of the SDG are the principal base that are, are having the human rights and human dignity approach. No? So this is uh, very, uh, how do you say, it is a hope for our, our indigenous people and also reflect uh, the relationships with the indigenous people in connecting with the um, UN Declaration on the Human, on the, uh, on the rights of indigenous people and uh, also taking account in the EPIC, no? in, in the free, prior and informed consent. So this is the right for indigenous people to participate in the decision making and advocacy so I think this kind of thing are, are some kind that indigenous people are hope a lot that SDG will be a channel for us to uh, implement in the community level in order for us to, to how to say, to have a equality and access to uh, uh, the everything. No? However, uh, according to, to Thailand, no? um, we found that our, uh, the Thai government already um, uh, moved for the SDG move or have been driving for quite a long time. 
but uh, it is many people we are not yet involved in the uh, in in the process in the mobilization process because of um I would say that um Thailand they are not recognized us no? we are they are not not yet recognized the Asian people are uh, so that why we are always exclusive in the process of the mobilization uh they always think that we are only the target people who are not have capacity to to manage ourselves so that why all the activity that have been done just by the middle organization that not directly to our grassroots organization like the, the community organization like that. So we are miss the uh, the process of the inclusive, no. So uh, and also the partnership uh, process also. So I I would say that that kind of the uh, issue that are uh, can how to say increase a, a lot of problem. It's not in not in those kind of try to solving the problem, but, but uh, instead no, but uh, increase a uh, a lot of problem for us. Because of even the government, they try to set up a, a lot of plan to implement on the SDG, but those kind of plan are not appropriate to our indigenous communities. Because of, for us, according to the uh, our indigenous people, we always talking uh, about the land issue, you know, always linking with the land issue, but we are always limited to access to our lands and uh, our resources. So that why, uh, if we connect to all the SDG goals, you know, with indigenous people, we cannot avoid are uh, the all the issue linking with the land issue are uh, not only for the um uh the target one that talking about the land only but according to the uh food security we we are a lot of depending on the land rights issue and now a lot of there are many policies that are declared and without consultation with indigenous people and there are policies in thailand that impact to our livelihood especially on to limit us to access to our land. And that also, um, how to say, to limit us to have the food security, we, we have been transferred of those kind of knowledge uh, for the food security for quite a long, but those kind of knowledge are not recognized. So that's why we are, now we uh, increase the, uh, the problem and most of the indigenous people who are who don't have the, the right to access to land, they have to migrate to live in the town and increase another problem in the town, in the city also. So this is just the, uh, some of the issue of the problem. So in order to, uh, how to say, to uh, to move forward, no? uh, for uh, making ensure the principle of uh, the, uh, the agenda of the leaving no behind, uh, no one behind. No? I think this kind of thing, you have to really think about the, inclusive the partic uh, partnership and the particip participatory approach and uh, firstly you have to really trust that our indigenous people we have our capacity we have um, our uh, how to say um, our resources that we are able to live in our territory our lands in sustainable way we have our knowledge to manage that kind of resources and uh, we those kind of knowledge we have been transferred for a long long time already but our our and that's kind of already proved that it is a sustainable way. But the, when the people are the outsider people, they saw that those uh, they are not realized about our our practice, our knowledge. So that's why there are many policies that are uh, impact to our livelihood. We cannot continue our uh, practice like that. And uh, I think if you believe that uh, we have the capacity to do so, the first thing is the inclusive to uh, for the indigenous people to involve in in the since in the very beginning and uh just uh how to say trust for us to be the lead initiative by ourselves and uh the outside organization you can support us at the, to pay the facilitation low or to coaching some uh, or support some resources for us so i think this kind of way it can uh, enhance the community to uh, uh to develop the capacity and also to support the community to solve their own problem and this will be the sustainable way and sometimes it don't need to spend a lot of resources because uh, they feel they are owner ownership of their own land and territories so i think this kind of method will be one of the method that uh, can be a sustainable way and other thing is the participatory approach we would say that um a lot of policy that are and are adopted in Thailand now are uh, have uh, have been declared and without any consultation or even though some consultation process have been done, but uh, uh, with uh, very limited for our Indigenous people to assess and um, with some with also the political 
policy uh, maker, you know, they have some discord or, and also they understand about their, their um, indigenous people that we are bad world, we are no education, we are no, have no knowledge like that. So uh, whenever you are thinking like that, so you are not able to solve the problem and uh, we, are always, we will be always outside the uh, decision making and not be able to participatory. Um, so I think this kind of uh, thing that um, as the uh, partnership. Sorry, yeah. uh, could you wrap, uh, please? Uh, okay. Apologize, uh, but we so that we can have a bit of time for the Q and A. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I I would really say that uh, if you feel that we are the the initial people as the partnership, no. So I think the inclusive and the participatory are very um, necessary for us to get involved in our processes. And we as traditional people, we are willing to, to be a good partnership for everyone. And we also have our organization, uh, it is an organization who are uh, who, who we are from the grassroots level. So uh, just just you trust that we are able to do by ourselves, but our, we have to, our, I mean, there are many funders or many resources that are still hardly for us to directly access. You know? So if we can get some channel to uh, receive some or funding or some resources or technical support directly to additional people, I believe that this it will be a kind to, uh, to uh, how to reach the all the targets. Yeah, yeah. So I, I will give more information in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for sharing this very strong and important message. Uh, it definitely linked with our previous presentation as well, uh, giving rights and also uh, trust to local communities, to local government, making sure that the meaning of no one left behind is actually applicable for all and being inclusive in the SDG implementation. Uh, so before we're moving to the fourth, pre, uh, the, the last presenter, sorry, I just want to mention that Tristan, we have a question from you in the Q&A, if you could answer that in the chat, and maybe if we have time, uh, then we could invite your comment. Uh, I see that Ploy is already answering questions. Uh, so yeah, uh, last but not least, we have uh, our last speakers, uh, which is Mr. Atapong Chantanumat. Director of the Policy and Master Plan Division Office of the National Water Resources Thailand. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Atapong uh, has an academic background in irrigation engineering, civil engineering, and construction management. And he has more than 20 years of experience in public sector from provincial to national level. Um, Mr. Atapong, if you uh, could have a brief presentation, that would be great. Yeah, I, I will share. Uh... My presentation. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, I will talk about the sustainable policy for water resource governance in Thailand. Because in Thailand, we have a uh, raw and regulation for water management. Because uh, in the first, we have the Water Resource Act. This one is the important key for to be the success. The second, we have the organization like the Water Resource Committee, uh, Water User Group, and river ba uh, the River Basin Committee. And the third, we have the guideline or 20-year water resource management master plan. And the fourth pillar, we have the knowledge and innovation and technology. This fourth, we will combine together to driving to the future and how in the fourth year of the ONWR that the regulator, we found that the, a lot of the problem in Thailand is have a problem and we will look back and look forward. Why? Because uh, we will apply for the 5P for the sustainable development like a people, planet of prosperity, peace and partnership to be together and to apply to the SDG and apply to the uh, water resource policy also. So, and the first four year, we found that we have the COVID pandemic. We have to have a lot of effects for the Thailand people. And I think that every country is, will have the effect also about the pandemic and the climate change. So we have the key for the success. 
we will apply to the nature-based solution and circular economy and eco-based system adaptation and digital technology. And after that, we will find how to save the people. We will apply the Sendai frameworks to be sustainable development goal to go to this, this the target. So in this uh in this way, we will use this uh the time to apply that because in the fourth year that we passed the government we use the top down policy only is we have a lot of the problem about the area base and area and the people is not understand about the policy what to to do but now we look back and we apply about the capped analysis so we will uh, pick up the policy and get the other government agency that we have more than 50 agency in Thailand to make about the water resources. So we'll combine all the plan. And after that, we get the plan to be the key uh, and add to the people problem. And we get the river basin uh, problem also and to get uh, together all to make it together. And after, after that, we will participate with the uh, uh, river basin committee and water user group and the uh, government agency to go together to have uh, the floor for open floor. In the floor, we will participate with the people and we let the uh, we need the the facilitator by the government uh, by the local facilitator to arrange. Because in the past, we use the facilitator that come from the university and other from the government. We will have the problem that the people cannot say anything to the government to make the policy. But we use the local people to be the facilitator. It's the key of the success to make the uh, co-creation plan. So the co-creation plan, we will make a new uh, rehabilitation to revise the 20-year uh, water resource management master plan. This one is we will revise by the people, by the uh, water user group that we participate. And after that, we used to we will combine about the five P to this situation in to make the people to understand how to balance this. And this one we go to the goal. So when we do it, uh, this plan. So the when we have the co-creation plan, the we will set up the about the water resilient management and plan with the co citizen co design. So the people need about the uh, to provide the people to equal basic drinking water service because uh, in the local area uh, we will have a problem about the drinking water about the uh, domestic use also. So this one is the top point that the people want to make the government to create this, this thing. So we, this one is to put to, to be the, the, uh, the important plan to, to be the master plan. And the second, the people like to support or to the economic development goal, reduce the damage and increase the income in the farmland, increase the production in the area and stable water because of uh, in the dry season we will have a, a drought because in Thailand in with the climate change in the past four years we will found that if we have a frequency that more than the average 10 years that passed so this one is important in about the agriculture uh, from the uh, we have a lot of effect you know, about for the water user group so in the about the agriculture side especially and it have the effect for the uh like the eec that we have the critical water to to also this one which will try to make it stronger to find the storage more storage and third about the resilience this one we have a lot of flood in thailand now so we will reduce the, the damage and life and no poverty impact to economic support climate change. So we will apply the Sendai plan to uh, these uh, strategies. And the fourth, 
how to recover about the uh, environment. So we will convince and restore the entire water resource economy ecosystem because this one now we use the uh, to apply about the green and gray structure together we will call the hybrid structure. So this one we will solve about to let to destroy to and make the understand to the people to conservation the forest and the fourth uh, and the fifth. This one is uh, important about the water management tool because the water management tool we will give the important about the, the farmer participation in water communities because uh, in the past the government the one who do and the one who manage but now we will turn it up to make the authorities to the uh, water user group because uh, the law is allow the water user group to management his own resources. So this one is the key of the success and with the government to make uh, the water user group to be strong by the set the knowledge and technology and apply the uh, local wisdom to, to be the truth for the people because when the uh, water management is not can cannot be applied from the top down because it's have the about the uh, geography uh, and uh, social and the culture that is different because in Thailand it's have the full part so this one is the important how to solve this problem so we use the participation and uh, in the past uh, in the irrigation area we have a choice management committee to be the one who can management the own his own the water resources by we set to be the committee and sharing about the need and about for uh, management the supply and the demand and supply to balance it and make it have a safety factor by the government come back to uh, like the consultancy only and the farmers we will manage by his own by the water user group but managed by his own and we will apply the technology to to be uh, the tools for the water user group because this one is important about the data the data is important for uh, decision what is the way to do the what the way to manage the leaks that we will happen and we will and and, and in the government side we will have a uh, use the digital lights to be uh, one website. This one will combine all the water resource and water situation. And we have to forecast the situation of the water in Thailand to about the one week, uh, one month and three three months for, for the guideline to be the, the uh, farmers and the water to, uh, and water when, uh, to to let the water user to manage his own by on by by use the data, and in the financing, in in the law we use the combine all the finance for, from the every agency because in the function this is have the fifty agency that we will uh, top down policy to do in the area, and the agenda is the from the policy to apply to area and we have the area uh budget also uh, so the Sorry, three budget I apologize yeah. Mr. Uh -huh. Atapong, will it be uh -huh. possible to wrap up soon okay yes so they're in the finance so we will let the provincial committee to be the set up the finance by his own so we will the adjustment by the committee and let the river basin committee to adjust and after that uh, all the need we will send to the ONWR, that's the one who, the regulator to endorse the, all the need of the river basin to be the cabinet to set the, the, uh, the plan. This one is a free, this one for the output, we will support all the sustainable development goal, especially for solve the no poverty, no hunger and good health by, and we have a gender equity. This one we will set from the driving by the uh, SDC 6, this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
And I do apologize that we are a bit like uh, out of the time uh, for all the panelists. It's all very interesting. And I saw that some of the questions are already being addressed. Uh, so we're actually supposed to finish uh, 1.30, but I see like all this excitement. If I could just take like five more minutes from of your time. Uh, and I think since there's no more question in Q&A, I would like to invite each of the panelists uh, just to close this session uh, to share their one sentence on the key takeaway points on how should we actually accelerate the SDGs achievement in the region. So maybe we can start with, um, we can start backwards. So we can start with Mr. Atapong and then Ms. Nitaya uh, and then Tristan and then Floyd and then Claudia. Yes, I think uh, the tool is for the success for the water resource development is about the participation because uh, we will know the need and the way how to do. And you you with the collaboration to decision together to drive the policy together with the people for the brands of the economic, social, and uh, geography. This one is an important thing to go together with the to development by uh, aware about the planet also, because this one is very important for it have a lot of effect for climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I keep hearing the same words. So co-developing, uh, shared co-knowledge and uh, and co-designing seems very important. And next, Ms. Nitaya. I think uh, she's not here, so maybe we, uh, okay, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. My internet is not stable. Yeah, so uh, I will get a last point for uh, for the panel that uh, I, indigenous people, you know, we are we really want to involve in the process of the development and also in the implementation of the SDG. And um, actually, there are many national plans that it, it should to be done in in the country level, especially relating on the climate change and all the CBD. You know, and we got to know that in Thailand now it's it's going to develop the NDCEP and also the NEP. You know? But uh, so we really hope to be one of the partnership to involve in the decision or in the design of the uh, implementing uh, plan. And uh, I think this kind of process, if you are involved us in the really beginning process, so uh, this kind of process will be, uh, 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 we will get, uh, how to say, more pa partnership and to be more uh, participatory for the, on, uh, from the senior people part. And you can have a more uh, different perspective from uh, the different groups. Huh? And we also would like to get the issue that we are now trying to uh, push the law the, uh, to uh, promote the additional people rights in Thailand and still in the process in the parliament. I really hope that for the future of uh, uh, political uh, of Thailand, no? uh, really hope that our issue will, will be raised uh, and be heard by the political uh, making, maker, no? Polit policy maker, and will be included in the, some of the policy. So, and other thing is um the other thing is uh, I would like to repeat again that um uh, just for uh, to to be uh feel trust for our indigenous people to be involved and be the partnership you know, in all levels. Yeah, I just would like to give you a short. Yeah. Thank you. Very well noted the importance of inclusivity, participatory making process in decision making, and a bottom up approach, including uh marginalized people and indigenous people in the SDGs. Uh, the next one would be Tristan. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so my, I think two recommendations, um, really building on what I was saying earlier on, is first of all, um, looking at how you can develop pathways from that enable, um, enable policies and strategies to connect with issues that affect people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. If we can do that and find those investment pathways that enable those um, investments to uh, both have direct real inputs on, on people's livelihoods, jobs, um, issues that really mean, mean something to people, whilst addressing uh, the climate crisis at the same time, um, I think that is a strategy which might that is challenging and difficult to find those pathways but if we can do that then i would encourage governments to really get behind behind that because that's really what's going to mobilize communities to get behind this agenda um 
And I think that sometimes, you know, talking about these very, talking about 1.5 degrees and net zero and decarbonization can be quite alienating to, to communities that are most impacted and at the front line um, and really experiencing these issues, but might not experience it as climate impact, but actually experience it as, 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 as impacts on their livelihoods and on their health and on their, on their food security and issues that are really uh, meaningful to, to them. <clears throat> Thanks, Tristan. Yes, yeah, very important to develop an inclusive pathways so where all these multi-stakeholder sectors can work together uh, despite the challenges that they face. Uh, next, we have Chloe. Thank you, Kuntum. I think, yeah, there's just no question anymore that fossil fuels are the root cause of multiple global environmental and public health crises we're facing today, climate change, air pollution, biodiversity loss, land degradation. And so we really need sustained um, and kind of long-term policy interventions to phase out coal, oil, and gas production and use in a rapid, managed, and equitable manner, and really think about protecting um, public health and welfare. Thank you. Thank you. I guess the message is clear. The time is now. We have to work very fast to transform it uh, to fossil to zero fossil fuel. Uh, and uh, last but not least, yeah, we have Claudia. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for all the impressive presentations. It was great to hear your experiences. Um, I will just share three recommendations. The first one is that um, we have advanced quite a lot in the recognition of partnerships for, uh, for sustainable development agendas from previous one to the 2003 agenda, but we should not stop here and we should continue and we should keep advocating for uh, transversal and, um, and, and work, uh, working together. Uh, the second one is emphasizing their, their role in the work at the local level with, uh, with local communities and with, with grassroots organizations. And the third one, um, that we need to keep doing this. We need to talk to each other, we need to hear to each other, and we need to learn from what is happening all over the world. So thank you very much for this exchange. Thank you very much. Yes, partnership and collaboration. And it's very interesting to highlight also how we should talk to each other, uh, because we all from different sectors, and sometimes we speak different languages, uh, like Tristan has mentioned, even though we're actually talking the same thing. So on behalf of SEI Asia as the host, I would like to express my gratitude to the presence of all of the speakers and participants for staying with us. Uh, SEI, together with its partners, are now actually underway to re-energize commitment, scale up action, and solicit scientific input to push on the agenda in the run up to September's SDG summit. So your presence and contribution in the session are very valuable for us. We definitely will take account of all of your comments and also all of your insight. So we hope that knowledge and experience that we have shared today will help to usher in a new era of transformative change. Uh, again, I think my, some of my colleagues already mentioned, feel free to reach out to us through Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, or any of the social media. Some of the panelists, feel free to drop your email. Um, and if you have any ideas, questions, or potential partnership on collaboration in accelerating the SDGs, uh, definitely contact us. Thank you very much for our session today. Thank you all the panelists. Thank you all the participants. Have a good day. Uh, and See you again soon, hopefully. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. -bye.